I'm particularly pleased to be here this morning because um, Break the Chains has been a project of Tide since we were founded four years ago. And it's been a really great relationship and partnership. So I was particularly honored that um, Drummond asked me to be part of this panel. And I think it's quite fitting that we talk about this issue inside of the broader distinction of talking about wars, because I think that there are a couple of issues related to that that I hope that we'll engage with today, one of which is this myth that we're a peaceable country, because we're not. We were founded in violence. We've been engaged in warring on something or some people pretty much from inception. And the idea that somehow what we're doing in Iraq is a major exception, I think is not really true. Um, but I'm here to talk about the war on drugs. And what I really want to do today is do three things. One, I want to talk about why the war on drugs is very similar to the war on, in Iraq and equally unwinnable. I want to talk specifically about things that we can do to help end that war and change the impact that it's having on so many lives of people both in this country and around the world. And then finally, I want to talk a little bit about the distinction war and um, some new ideas that hopefully will gain some momentum out of our gathering here. So to begin with, I want to just start talking about the top 10 reasons I made a quick list about why the war on drugs is like the war in Iraq. Reason number one, like the Iraq war, Americans were duped into supporting it based on false assumptions about drug use, addiction, and drug-related crime. You know, assumption that somehow you can scare people out of using drugs. Assumption you can punish them out of their addiction. That drug-related crime is about drugs and not about money. Two, like the Iraq war, the goalposts for winning are constantly shifting. First, we said that we wanted a drug-free America, which is kind of ridiculous in a country where you can't watch television for 20 minutes without being seeing a commercial for some product that's going to help some condition that you didn't even know they had until they came up with a cure for it. But nonetheless, we started out with drug-free America. Then we said, well, we just wanted people to just say no. But when they kept saying yes, then we said, well, so maybe we just want to reduce drug use. And since we can't really reduce it across the board, we just want to reduce it among teenagers. So every year we get new statistics about that, which make us believe that somehow we're winning the war on drugs. And yet, those same kids are being fed Ritalin at a rate that's astonishing. Three, like the war on drugs, like the Iraq war, the casualties of the war on drugs are deliberately hidden from the public. In the same way that our government has chosen to make sure that we never see the body bags of the people that are dying on our behalf, we don't see the casualties of the war on drugs because we lock them up in prison for outrageously long periods of time. We hide them away from us when they get out. We impose all kinds of sanctions on them that continue long after they've gotten out of prison, if they ever get out, because after all, if you've done drugs, you're a bad person, you must be punished. And in the US, you never stop being a felon. You're a felon for life. <sighs> like the Iraq war, we are regularly perpetrating human rights violations, including torture against innocent and defenseless people. You know, most people don't realize that among the folks who get caught up and hurt by the drug war are the people who acquire HIV AIDS because we refuse to provide funding for needle exchange. Because in our world, if you're a drug user, we'd rather see you die than stay healthy. The innocent kids who lose their parents for 10, 15 years at a time. I find it amazing that we continue to have this conversation about the responsibility or lack of responsibility of black men, and yet we never talk about the policies that we put in place that make it impossible for them to feed their families, to be a man based on what we say being a man is about, or to find a place for themselves economically in the legitimate economy. We don't want to acknowledge the fact that in many parts of our country, drug dealers are the only equal opportunity employers. Like, 
The Iraq war, by ignoring the casualties of the war on drugs, we are sowing the seeds for future discontent and calamity. You don't have to go very far from where we are right now to see the long-term impact of the things that we've been doing. It shows up in the lives of our youth who join gangs because they don't have parents, who join gangs because they are constantly under attack by the police, who believe that five youth of color together is a gang, five white kids in the suburbs is a club. And we continue to do that and think that that has no long-term impact on where we're going and what kind of country we're going to have. Like the Iraq war, the drug war is causing us to spend billions of dollars that have done very little to enhance public safety or significantly solve the underlying problem. When you think about the billions of dollars that we have spent fighting the war on drugs, and yet if you ask anyone, you know, this whole idea of drug pushers is amazingly stupid to me because all you have to do is let people know that you have the drugs. They sell themselves. All of what we've done has made very little difference in terms of availability, price, or access. But what we have done is funded a huge criminal enterprise that's perverted our system on so many different levels that I don't have time to talk about it. Like the Iraq war, the war on drugs has resulted in a significant erosion of civil liberties in the name of national security. So it's fine for the police to knock down doors in the middle of the night in full military gear or to come into school buildings with dogs early in the morning to look at six graders that they hold guns on because they're searching for marijuana. Okay, it's fine to get family members to snitch on each other to avoid a long sentence. You know, we have this whole conversation about, you know, witness intimidation and snitching as if somehow the things that we've been doing with our law enforcement have not created an environment in which people do not trust the police on any level because they've been forced to turn on each other as the only way to avoid having to spend 15 or 20 years in prison for selling a small amount of drugs, usually not even worth the cost of what we lock them up for. Like the Iraq war, prosecution of the war on drugs has hurt our standing in the world community and negatively affected our foreign policy. I spent a week or so ago in Vienna at one of the meetings of NGOs looking at this issue. And I have to tell you, Americans should be ashamed of the way in which we bully the rest of the world into following our policies. It doesn't matter that the Swiss public believes that it's better for them to have safe places for addicts to um, inject so that they don't overdose. That it's okay that they want needle exchange to reduce the spread of HIV AIDS. We tell them, no, you can't do that. And those countries who rely on us for money, we do more than tell them, no, we threaten them. Say, we'll take back our aid money if you don't do things the way that we say. And we don't care if that increases the level of violence and disease in your country. We just want you to continue following the US line, even though our line is the wrong line. Like the Iraq war, public officials continue to support it, despite significant public disapproval. We're in California, the state that voted for medical marijuana, the state that voted for treatment over incarceration, due to the efforts of some of my colleagues who are right here in the room, I'm proud to say. Please. And yet, we have a federal government that refuses to acknowledge the legitimacy of those decisions. Somehow our notion of federalism, which is supposed to allow for some level of local control about issues that are important to the populace, gets completely disrespected when you start talking about drugs. So not only do we not allow for um, the local medical marijuana cooperatives to do their business and to serve the people who their doctors have sent to them, but in D.C., when voters there voted for a similar initiative, the Congress wouldn't even let them count the votes. You know, talking about democracy, let's talk about disenfranchisement. Let's talk about the fact that we wouldn't have the Bush administration, not only because they stole Florida in 2000, but one of the ways they did that was by purging black people from the rolls. And all they had to do was say that these folks have felony convictions, they shouldn't be there. Whether it was true or not, and because Americans are so used to the idea that black people are associated with criminality, there wasn't a big hue and cry about the fact that hundreds and thousands of people 
was stricken, many of whom had the right to vote. And given the slim margin of victory that Bush was able to assert, we would have had a very different outcome if we didn't do that. Not to mention the fact that we're one of the only countries in the world that disenfranchises people as a result of a criminal conviction. And if you look at the history of that, you know that it's exactly designed to suppress the votes of people of color. That's the reason that we started it. That's the reason that we continue it. Final issue on how they're the same is like the Iraq war, the war on drugs will only end when the public demands to, that it end and enforces that demand politically. And I have to say that it saddens me that in spite of 40 years of failure in the war on drugs, in spite of the fact that we have now become the largest imprisoning nation in the world of its own people, you don't see anywhere near the level of hue and cry about dealing with that war as you do with the war in Iraq. You don't have a move on for drugs. You don't have a group of people who are out there lobbying Congress to get rid of the policies that disproportionately affect black men. But what you do have is people applauding themselves for the fact that they're willing to vote for a black man at the same time that they're willing to continue locking up thousands. And I have to tell you, I'm a Barack Obama supporter, I'm proud to say it, but I'm also very clear that his election is not going to change the issues of institutional racism in this society unless people are willing to acknowledge the reality of that. And that's not about whether or not you like or support or are willing to live with or work with any particular people of color. It's about whether or not you're willing to acknowledge that we live in a society that puts people on particular tracks. And it does it based on race, it does it based on class, it does it based on geography. And if we're not willing to actually acknowledge that, all of the progressive candidates in the world aren't going to make a difference to really solving the problems that are plaguing this country. Now I want to talk about some specific things that should be on the policy agenda, because I'm a policy advocate and I can't resist this opportunity to get people thinking about what actually needs to happen. So part of a federal policy agenda, eliminate the crack powder cocaine sentencing disparity. It is shameful and criminal that we are still locking people up a hundred times longer for offenses involving crack cocaine versus powder cocaine and that 80% plus of those federal defenders continue to be African American men. Even though if you read the New York Times on Sunday, you know that there's plenty of white men who've been using crack all along. And I just want to talk about it from a practical point of view. Five grams of crack in any city in this country is not worth a thousand dollars. And yet by requiring that people go to prison for five years for that, we're willing to spend $150,000 to prosecute somebody for a $1,000 crime. What sense does that make? We need to repeal mandatory minimum drug sentencing. The amount of time that we give to people for low-level drug crimes is criminal. In the rest of the world, five years is considered a sentence for a violent crime. Five years is on the low end of what we give to people for nonviolent drug crimes. We need to repeal post-conviction sanctions that deny people access to housing, employment, public assistance, child custody, and their right to vote because they've had a drug conviction. I mean, that is so absurd that if you actually wanted people to rehabilitate yourself, themselves, that you would still continue to punish them long after they got out of prison. You have to think that that is automatic recidivism by request that we've chosen. We need to lift the federal ban on funding for needle exchange programs. I mean, more than 30 years into the AIDS epidemic, the fact that we still won't do it for political reasons is beyond criminal. Some people would say it's genocidal, particularly given the high rates of HIV AIDS in black and brown communities that are related to drug use right now, today. We need to forget about the zero tolerance policies and sentencing enhancements for school zone drug activity which never arrest people for drugs during the school day, 
but turn whole cities into places where you can end up getting 45 and 50 years in prison because you happen to be somewhere near a school, a child care center, or whatever. And the police deliberately arrest people in those areas so that they can give them those kind of sentences. We need to think about what we do, what we're saying when we enact those kind of laws. We need to allow the rescheduling of marijuana for both medicinal and recreational purposes. You know, I was so happy that Drummond talked about the fact that he was working on this issue more than 30 years ago, because 30 years ago we knew then that it was stupid for us to be prosecuting people for marijuana the way we do and treating it as a Schedule One offense, and yet we still keep doing it. Absurd. We need to stop giving financial incentives to the police to elevate drug law enforcement over every other criminal activity. I mean, since when does buying, using, or selling drugs become the number one crime that police need to spend their time going after? If we're really seriously in a war on terror, or terrorism, which is a whole nother issue, why would we have the police making marijuana arrests at the rate of 750,000 a year? 50,000 of which are taking place in my own city of New York, which arrests more people for marijuana possession than any other city in the world, even though we decriminalized marijuana possession 30 years ago. So go figure that one. And not surprisingly, 85% of all those arrestees are African American or Latino men under the age of 25. Racial profiling, effective policing, I call it racism, in effect, that we've sanctioned with our dollars and our laws. Finally, I want to just talk specifically about the issue of war. What does it mean to come to things from a war paradigm? You know, um, we have a war against drugs and a war against poverty and a war for this or that. By doing that, we're saying that we are accepting the notion of conflict always, that that's the way in which we think that issues get resolved. I think we need to look at a society about the way in which we've structured the things that we do that have it be based on conflict. I look at this election, and it appalls me the way that we talk about winning and losing. Why can't we talk about voting as preference? like the way that we choose our clothes, or the things that we like or don't like. It doesn't mean that jeans have won out over khaki because you chose to wear one over the other. And yet that's the way in which we talk about everything that's important in our society, as if somehow that's the measure of the way in which we do things. And I say that that paradigm is one that keeps us locked into modes of, rea of, of behavior that don't really work for us. That's why we call our organization Break the Chains, because we want people to break the chains of thinking and acting in ways that don't work, and to actually reassess what they're doing. And the final thing I want to say is that for those of you who live in California, you have a unique opportunity this November to reassess the way in which this state deals with prisoners, people coming in. There's going to be the Nonviolent Offender Rehabilitation Act of 2008 on the ballot put on by my colleagues at Drug Policy Alliance. It will require the state to provide services and funding for reentry to enable people to rebuild their lives and to limit the ways and the times in which the state can continue to keep them incarcerated. It's the first step towards ending this insanity that we call the war on drugs, and hopefully having us believe and begin to think about ways that we can have a system that supports people instead of hurting them. I believe that our basic underlying principle for all public policy is that whatever we do should not cause more harm than the issue that we're trying to address. We should never have a law in effect that hurts people more than the thing that we're supposed to be trying to protect them from. Thank you very much.